Thank you. Today, I'd like you to consider the value of one tree. Imagine one tree. What does your tree look like, and where is it growing? This view reminds me of a farm that I grew up on, 100 acres of openness with a single lonely tree on the horizon of a distant field. What difference does one tree make? There are many studies that have shown that one tree is very important. Uh, I was surprised to see how many studies in the scientific literature focused on the value of one tree. In this particular example, in going from an open field to a tree that had only, uh, to a field that had only one tree, uh, marked a doubling of the biodiversity in terms of birds, in terms of insects in terms of bats. One tree makes a big difference. In this specific example, in going from the doubling of biodiversity that one tree brings, the second or third tree didn't really add that much. And if you compare a field having only one tree to a field having more than 100 trees, a 100% increase in the density of trees only yielded less than a two-fold uh, increase in the diversity of birds that were present. One tree makes a difference. And in this case, we see the value and the importance of going from nothing to something. This is also uh, a famous single tree. The tree of Tenere, uh, is known or was known as the world's most isolated tree. It's a member of the genus of acacia, and uh, it's growing here in this picture uh, at least 400 kilometers away from the nearest tree. Above ground, it only stands several meters high, but it has a root system that exten extends 40 meters deep to groundwater uh, well below the desert surface. In 1973, this tree was knocked over by a drunk driver. How drunk or how bad a driver would you have to be <laughs> to knock over the world's most isolated tree? The tree was replaced by this replica. The importance of one tree in this particular community, if there is a community there, is shown by the fact that uh, the government of the Republic of Niger issued a commemorative stamp to mark this tree's, uh, or, or to mark the anniversary of this tree's death. Of course, trees come in many shapes and sizes, and they live in many different kinds of environments. This tree, for example, a 3,000-year-old bottle a baobab tree growing in Madagascar uh, perhaps was the inspiration for uh, Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> we should ask ourselves before we go deeper into contemplating the value of one tree, what one tree really is. This picture is actually, according to some definitions of what an individual is, showing one aspen tree in the state of Utah. This is a clone of all male trees growing over a, a, an area of about 100 acres, uh, and it's thought to be the largest single living organism, and perhaps the, uh, the oldest organism on the planet. It, this clone is thought to be at least 10,000 years old. So again, this is different than, say, uh, one solitary bristlecone pine or one coastal redwood tree. But according to some definitions about what one individual is, this could be one individual tree. Here's another case of one tree that, that seems to uh, be more than it appears. On the left-hand side, we see red oak sprouts coming out of a stump from a tree that was cut five years earlier. So these sprouts represent only five years' growth. And this particular habit that many hardwood tree species have is important, first of all, to the survival of the tree. This is a way 
that the tree can cope with disturbance in the environment, but it's a way that we can also uh, take advantage of being able to regenerate forests using this as a backup plan when recruitment of seedlings is not really a possibility. This is one tree that can yield this kind of biomass on a regular basis. These sprouts can be harvested over and over again. This is a tree, one tree, uh, that keeps giving and giving. Trees are storytellers, archivists, and historians. Uh, here are two balsam fir trees, the big one collected from the interior of Newfoundland and the very small one in the middle collected from the coast of Newfoundland where salt spray, wind, uh, winter icing, uh, and perhaps a bit of shade have suppressed its growth. Two trees, same species, they're the same age. They're 90 years old. So the stories that they would tell and the histories that they have experienced would be very different. Here's a cross-section of a sequoia tree, the Museum of Natural History in London. This tree has many stories to tell, which if you visit it, uh, you can, uh, you, you can uh, get a sense of. Um, but this tree, is, as large it is, as it is, only lived to about half of its lifespan. This is a 1,300-year-old, uh, this was a 1,300-year-old tree. Uh, sequoia trees in California can reach ages of 2,500 years. One tree can be an important indicator of the state of the environment. This information comes from white birch trees growing one and a half kilometers from a nickel copper smelter near Sudbury. And if we follow the annual increment of the tree, this blue line, uh, and the red line, the sulfur dioxide emissions over time, we see that the growth of the tree is very closely linked to the environment. And with changes to sulfur dioxide emissions in the 1970s, we see that the tree responded to those reductions. And in fact, these two traces are mirror images of each other. Trees, of course, have considerable spiritual value. Here's our friend and hero, Jane Goodall, saying a little prayer for a tree that she planted near Sudbury, Ontario. If you're looking for the meaning of life, you're more likely to find it in front of a tree than, say, a computer screen. Something that I like about my job as a biologist is that I spend every day looking for the meaning of life. Trees provide many goods and services, and here is a list that I've given you that only scratches the surface of what a tree can do. Some of these services we can easily put a dollar value on. Others, not so much. It's unfortunate that we have to value a tree according to the dollar amount that we can attribute to what it does. Excuse me. Here's an example of the value of one tree growing in Ann Arbor, Michigan, a sugar maple tree. And these dollar amounts don't seem very high, but remember, this, isn't not, this is not the value of the tree. This is the annual benefit according to one calculation that this tree offers. As we recognize the different services and the important roles that trees have in our urban environments, we see that municipalities uh, are appreciating the value of trees more and more. And urban forestry is something that we see uh, in, in many uh, urban centers. One tree can bring a community together. I've had many experiences with students that show that young people who take part in a community event like a tree planting uh, outing here uh, or some other kinds of hands-on experience really see the world in a much different way as a result of that experience. Uh, I think this gentleman's name is Gifford. And here we see him taking part in a tree planting event in North Bay, Ontario in 2005. He liked it so much that he's back in 2011. How will his life be changed by having engaged in these two events? 
the previous picture might represent the um, act locally part of that phrase that involves local and global things. But this African community is also acting locally. We're very blessed in this part of the world to have uh, the amount of forest resources that we do. And in most cases, they're managed very, very well. But in many developing countries, uh, forests are a thing of the past. And it's easy for us to think that the value of one tree in a developing country like this African nation represented here uh, would be worth a lot more than a single tree might be here at home. In developing countries, the loss of forests means poverty, a lack of water, and a lack of food. Imagine the possibilities that these single trees represent in this particular situation. The Canadian Institute of Forestry has extended its focus beyond our local Canadian forests to forests abroad. And they have begun a program called Forests Without Borders, in which foresters from Canada offer their time and their expertise to try and restore forests in developing countries. If you've ever doubted the relationship between the health of the environment and the well-being of the humans that live in that particular location, all you need to do is travel to a developing country that has lost all of its trees. One of the ways that Forests Without Borders funds its many activities is through something called pennies for seeds. It's interesting to think that one seed costs one penny, and we hope that it will turn into a tree that has immeasurable value. I'd like you now to consider a valuable tree. What does your tree look like? Perhaps it looks something like this uh, large western red cedar. Perhaps you're imagining something like General Sherman here, which is a, a, an old sequoia tree growing in Sequoia National Park in California. General Sherman is the world's biggest tree, uh, not counting that clone in Utah, which is, uh, according to some people, cheating. On, on its own as a single stem, there's no larger tree than General Sherman. It's not the tallest tree in the world. It's not the oldest tree. It's not the widest tree. It's just the beefiest tree that has the most wood. What is the value of this tree? Well, if you harvested General Sherman and just took the stem, the branches themselves are bigger than any tree than we have in Canada. Uh, well, maybe not so much in BC, but the branches are really large. But if you just took the stem of General Sherman and cut it up, you would get something like 630,000 uh, board feet of lumber. And if you cut one inch by 12 inch uh, wide planks, you could extend those boards end to end for a distance of 200 kilometers. I'm sorry to be mixing up my imperial and metric units, but General Sherman grows in the United States. Anyway, uh, the wood that would come from this tree could be sold perhaps at a building center for two to three million dollars. That's one way to value this tree. But if we left the tree standing, and it has been for 2,500 years, and when we consider that one million people a year visit General Sherman, they pay on average $10 each for the privilege, that represents not a one-time payout of several million dollars, but an annual payout of $10 million. So this is a very different way to look at the value of one tree. This is a high-profile tree, of course, but it's a very different way. And we haven't even factored in the amount of carbon that's stored in the tree the amount of carbon dioxide that would be released in processing the lumber from this one stem. Now, imagine a tree that has very little value. Are there any trees out there that have little value? <clears throat> it's
If the sequoia tree represents, in our tale of two trees, the best of times, this is the worst of times. This is, uh, these are two pictures of a scrubby white birch tree growing in a particularly interesting situation near Sudbury, Ontario. These trees are growing on an abandoned roast yard where between the years 1917 and 1929, uh, nickel copper ore used to be pre-treated before the actual smelting process to burn off all of the sulfur that was in this ore. So after, after this kind of an activity, uh, there were lots of toxic particulates that would remain in the soil and the soil became highly acidified. This is a historic picture that shows that activity from 1917. Here we see heaps of the raw ore being piled on this cordwood and this roast bed extends for about two kilometers. Uh, when the ore was piled, the wood would be ignited and the ore would roast sometimes for four months at a time giving off a lot of black smoke. This is what the roast yard looks like now. The O'Donnell roast bed, as it's called, was closed in 1929. It took 50 years for the first plant to colonize this area. They happened to be a couple of species of metal tolerant grass. And by another 20 years, there had only been an addition of one or two more herbaceous species. It wasn't until about the 1980s that the first birch trees became established here somehow. So you can see white birch trees at one end of this roast bed. But still, much of it remains as a very toxic environment. And you can see the bright red from the iron, and you can see green from the copper, and yellow from the sulfur. Uh, it, it's actually quite a, a photogenic environment. But even today, for the most part, this is what most of the roast yard looks like. Uh, it's bare, devoid of vegetation. The soil is toxic. It's highly acidic. There's no organic material, so there's very little water holding capacity. Uh, and it's an exposed environment. The surface temperatures here commonly reach 50 degrees C on a warm day in the summer. And yet, every once in a while, white birch seedlings try to make a go of it. The ones that might survive to become saplings or young trees undergo many hardships. For example, the soils are very toxic, and they're also nutrient deficient. So they're rich in, in the chemicals that the plant doesn't really want in large quantities and poor in the ones that it needs. And so we see uh, the symptoms, uh, like the marginal chlorosis here, of that struggle. But what the white birch trees do is pave the way for other species. This pine tree should not be growing in the O'Donnell roast bed. And there's no way that it could have even become established to this extent if it wasn't for the fact that that one tree, that birch tree, was there. The birch tree offers uh, shade, because it is a very exposed environment. We not only have the toxicity challenges of the soil, but we have a very harsh microclimate. And in, in the absence of soil moisture, drought uh, is always a possibility. So again, the birch tree in this case acts as a nucleus that paves the way for other plants to colonize the O'Donnell roast bed. Uh, the birch tree traps organic material. Uh, it drops occasional dead branches and contributes to the organic matter just under the tree. It improves the water holding capacity. The birch tree stimulates the activity of various microorganisms that help to detoxify the soil and to make that soil more fertile. If it wasn't for the white birch tree, these other plants would not be here. Even after dying, the sphere of influence can be seen from this old birch tree. We still see that the plants live there. There are lichens and mosses growing here, and the organic contribution to the soil is evident. 
One of the things that makes it possible for the birch tree to survive in this environment is its relationship with this particular fungus, Scleroderma flavidum. This is a fungus commonly associated with birch trees. The birch tree on my front yard uh, is associated with this uh, fungus, but this relationship is very important in the O'Donnell roast bed. The hyphae of this fungus extend throughout the root zone of the tree and, and join with the tree to form a very extensive root system that is 100 to 1,000 times uh, larger in terms of absorptive surface area than the tree roots alone. So in this challenging environment, the fungus makes it much easier for the tree to get limited water and limited nutrients to tolerate drought and the effects of soil infertility. But that's not all. This fungus also confers a significant degree of nickel tolerance onto the birch tree. Studies have shown that birch seedlings inoculated with this fungus in the root system take up far less nickel than those seedlings that are not inoculated. In fact, the, the situation that we have here is the beginning of something significant. We've already gone from nothing to something here because of one tree to the point where we have a reasonably large diversity of fungi and lichens and mosses and vascular plants and for sure other organisms. And it all started with one tree. This frog could not be on the O'Donnell roast bed. Uh, so it's really interesting the effect that the presence of that birch tree has in giving a disturbed ecosystem a kickstart and to get all of those important elements that make for a functional and diverse ecosystem uh, to get them going. What is the value of one tree? And is the value of a scrubby white birch tree on the O'Donnell roast bed far different than the value of, say, a giant sequoia? The, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, General Sherman has survived for 2,500 years uh, in California. And 2,500 years from now, even after white birch trees are gone from the O'Donnell roast bed, will their presence still somehow be felt uh, in, in that time in future, 2,500 years down the road. Excuse me. One tree, especially one that has overcome so much adversity and has made such a difference just because of its presence and persistence reminds us of what is possible. <laughs>